The former chief executive of Wirecard, Marcus Brown, has been arrested. The Legal trial attached to Germany's biggest ever accounting scandal begins in Munich today. Wirecard was a fintech scam that defrauded an entire country. As Germany held up their shiny new tech giant as an example of ingenuity to rival that of Silicon Valley, neither the auditors, regulators, nor government ministers could admit that behind the complicated accounts, the emperor was naked. Over 20 years, Wirecard invented fake clients, generated fake profits, and invested them in fake assets worth billions. Then, they set their sights on Germany's largest bank, and it became a race between the tech giant and a small group of English journalists intent on exposing them. Carving out a market share for a small payment processor wasn't easy, but they did it by focusing on the payments the other processors didn't want, namely gambling and pornography, which they rebranded as emotional content for the sake of delicate investors. The benefit of working with the seedier online vendors was that, as they had few alternatives, they could be charged higher commission fees. So, where a standard payment processor worked for 2-3% commission, Wirecard charged sites like Porn Japan and eye-watering 10%. They also won customers as they were willing to miscode illegal transactions. For example, in regions where online gambling was prohibited, they'd put the payment through as something innocuous, like a florist. Soon, the company was soaring, and in 2005, it joined the Frankfurt stock market by taking over the listing of Infogenie, a defunct call center group, allowing them to avoid the scrutiny of an initial public offering. Then, in 2010, they appointed Braun's protege, Jan Marzalek, as COO and announced their intention for global expansion. The company spent the next few years attracting 500 million euros of investments and expanding at a staggering pace. They bought up small, obscure payment companies across Asia and established a regional headquarters in Singapore. They acquired hundreds of thousands of merchants, including Aldi, Lidl, and almost 100 airlines, secured licensing agreements with both Visa and MasterCard, and expanded into the prepaid card business. At its peak, Wirecard had 5,000 employees, 250,000 merchants, and was valued at more than 24 billion euros. The problem with global expansion is that each region requires its own licenses to carry out financial operations, licenses that Wirecard didn't have. To get around this, they started using third-party companies to process the payments. This meant that customers would give their bank details to Wirecard, who would pass them on to a third party, and the third party would arrange the payment from the bank to the merchant. In return, the third party paid Wirecard a commission, which was sent to an escrow account. This is fairly standard practice, but what was less standard is that Wirecard wasn't withdrawing the funds to their own bank. Instead, they left them there and allowed them to build up to the value of $1.9 billion. The first red flag was waved as early as June 2008 by the German shareholder association SDK, which accused Wirecard of falsifying their 2007 accounts. In response, they appointed Ernst & Young to conduct an audit. Happily for them, the auditors gave them a clean bill of health, and the director of SDK was forced to resign and threatened with prison time for share price manipulation. This tactic would become Wirecard's go-to, and EY was appointed as their sole auditor for the next decade. While Wirecard weren't accused of any wrongdoings, it got its name into the crosshairs of short sellers. These are investors who make money by identifying companies whose share price is likely to fall rather than rise. They borrow the security, sell it on the open market, then buy it back for a lower price and pocket the difference. The further the price falls, the more money they make. One particular short seller, Matthew Earle, was alerted to Wirecard by a reader of his blog and launched his own investigation. He discovered that the company was facilitating illegal gambling payments in the US, and when he looked into it, he discovered that those transactions were being carried out by a firm in the UK called Blue Tool. Weirdly, this wasn't a city-based business operating out of any financial district, but a small house in a remote English village. The owner wasn't a fintech entrepreneur. In fact, he knew nothing about payment processing at all. But 
he had been interested in free money. So, when someone had knocked on his door and offered him 50 pounds to sign his name and occasionally post back some letters, he agreed. Earl wrote up his findings as the Zatara Report. However, to make the most money from short-selling Wirecard, he needed to get the story out to a wider audience than his own blog readers, so he contacted Dan McCrum, writer for the Financial Times, who'd already looked into Wirecard but had hit a dead end. In 2015, Earl and McCrum both published their findings, and Wirecard's shares took a massive hit. But they fought back. McCrum hadn't mentioned in his article that a short seller had written the Zatara report. This opened him up to accusations of share price manipulation, which Wirecard was quick to jump on and threatened the Financial Times with legal action. At this point, Wirecard began to reveal its darker side. Jan Marzalek, the charming COO, was actually a pretty scary guy. He had connections, notably, with Russia's military intelligence directorate, the agency accused of multiple assassinations. He took trips as a guest of the Russian military, hung out with Russian colonels and officers, and was a close friend of a former chief of Libyan intelligence. And later, in 2018, he'd attempted to recruit 15,000 militiamen with the anti-humanitarian aim of preventing refugees from fleeing war in Libya. This made him incredibly intimidating, particularly to McCrum, who became convinced he was being followed and started fearing for the safety of his family. Wirecard's legal threats and apparent intimidations didn't put McCrum or the Financial Times off, though, and they kept reporting. But no matter how damning their articles were, they couldn't fell the tech giant. Brexit was just kicking off, so nobody in Europe was particularly interested in listening to a journalist from the UK trying to take down Germany's new golden child. Eventually, Marslick became so frustrated with the constant attacks and subsequent share price dips that he arranged to meet with Paul Murphy the head of investigations at the FT. Over lunch, he tried to pressure him to stop writing about Wirecard. Murphy agreed they'd stop republishing old evidence, but if anything new came to light, that was fair game. Marzalek left seemingly happy, assuring him there'd be nothing else to find. But later, a man was caught across the river from the FT building with high-tech listening equipment, pointed directly at Murphy's office. Of course, it wasn't long before the next scandal emerged. In Wirecard's Singapore headquarters, lawyer Pav Gill had received a troubling report from a member of the finance team. Apparently, the branch's head of accounting, Ido Kurniawan, had called his staff into a meeting and tried to train them in how to cook the books. His strategy involved a tactic called round-tripping, essentially moving money from Wirecard in Germany to a faux customer, and then back to Wirecard in India, making it look like legitimate revenue. Gill immediately launched a massive internal investigation called Project Tiger, and his results were shocking. Not only did he confirm the round-tripping and falsification of accounts, but he also found evidence of forgery, money laundering, and corruption. Naturally, Gill reported his findings back to Germany, and Marzalek was assigned to conduct another internal investigation. However, it soon became clear that this was all for show. No one was going to discipline Kurniawan because he was doing exactly what he was supposed to. So bravely, Gill blew the whistle and compiled a dossier of evidence, which he sent to the German regulators, Boffin, and Wirecard's auditor, EY. He also obtained mirror copies of the email inboxes of all parties involved, which he gave to Dan McCrum at the FT. Now that both the auditors and the German regulators had possession of overwhelming evidence of wrongdoing, you'd think this would be the end of the story. Remarkably, though, it's not. EY, which now should have had enough evidence for a truly damning audit, instead allowed itself to be manipulated by Wirecard executives. As the accusations centered around phony Asian dealings, the auditors decided that an online shopping spree was in order. They bought a week's subscription to an Asian porn site, coins for FIFA, a breathalyzer, and a thousand yen worth of Bitcoin. All of the transactions were successful, but they were all set up by Wirecard executives in order to dupe the auditors, and again, Wirecard was awarded a clean bill of health. In an effort to protect their prized pet fintech, Boffin didn't take action against Wirecard. Instead, they issued an unprecedented ban on short-selling their stocks 
and launched legal proceedings against Dan McCrum and Stefania Palma, another FT reporter who had been working in Asia. Again, they were accused of market manipulations, and headlines ran insisting the reports were a foreign conspiracy against a German company. Rather than back down, though, McCrum and Palma continued their investigation, and their next step took them to Asia. From Gill's Mirror Drives, McCrum had figured out that half of Wirecard's global sales could be attributed to three relatively unknown companies, an unlikely source of Wirecard's billions. With Bluetool, the fake UK payment processor, fresh in his mind, McCrum decided that it'd be a good idea to check out these three firms in person, and he and Palma met up in Asia. Immediately, their suspicions were confirmed. PayEasy was nothing more than some branding on the window of a bus station. Max Cone was an empty warehouse in Manila, and Cone Pay was the home of a retired seaman in the Philippines. Happily, he was kind enough to provide the reporters with evidence, a letter he'd received a year before addressed to Cone Pay from none other than Wirecard. You see, by faking their profits, Wirecard had given themselves a problem. At some point, their auditors would want to see the cash. I'm asking you nicely. Where's the money? So, they'd had to spend their fake money on something equally fake. Their solution was to mock up and buy out small payment processing companies linked to real addresses. Addresses just far enough away that EY wouldn't bother boarding a flight to check them out. Clearly, they didn't anticipate the relentless reporting of McCrum and Palma. Once the two reporters realized they'd cracked it, they raced home to publish the story. Surely, this time, it would be enough to bring the tech giant down. But, yet again, Wirecard responded by denying the claims and suing the FT and the Singapore authorities. Then, incredibly, they managed to secure a 900 million euro investment from SoftBank, a Japanese tech investor. The Financial Times had proven that Wirecard's entire business model was to fake clients, fake profits, and then spend those fake profits on fake partners. Nothing about it was real, yet people were still investing. So, the team started plotting how to take the company down for good. Unfortunately, though, their efforts were suddenly delayed by a slip of the tongue. Murphy had met a short seller, Nick Gold, at a birthday party and given him his number in case he ever had any stories. Months later, Gold called him, but as the FT were at the height of their investigation, Murphy quickly said, I can't do it for two weeks because I'm stuck on Wirecard. That was the end of the conversation, and he thought nothing more of it. To Gold, though, it was big news. He assumed that given their history, any FT story would be a bad one and started short-selling Wirecard as fast as he could. This attracted the attention of the tech giant, but rather than approach him directly, Wirecard decided to use him to bring down the Financial Times for good. They arranged a meeting between Gold and a fake sheik looking to pay for his services as an investor. At the meeting, Gold bragged that he'd been told that a damning FT article was about to drop and that he could make the sheik a lot of money. Of course, Wirecard was recording, and within hours, the story was out that the FT was corrupt and both Murphy and McCrum were suspended. Wirecard knew the vultures were circling, but Braun had an idea, nicknamed Project Panther. He concluded that they couldn't hide their false accounting in Wirecard's books any longer, so they needed bigger books. And what could be bigger than those of Deutsche Bank, Germany's largest bank? So, quickly, Wirecard started laying the groundwork for a hostile takeover that would result in Wirebank, the ultimate hiding place for dodgy accounts. However, the FT, angered by being sued, responded with a full-on assault. Article after article was released exposing inflated profits in Dubai and Dublin, double counting of cash in escrow accounts, and fake customers. Wirecard denied all knowledge, but eventually had to concede to an external audit conducted by a company other than EY. They appointed KPMG, and investors waited with bated breath to find out whether or not the profits, customers, and cash actually existed. Then, in April 2020, they released their findings. The auditors could not verify the arrangements responsible for the lion's share of Wirecard's profits, and they questioned the existence of the claimed 1 billion euro cash balance. For the next few months, chaos ensued. The Deutsche Bank takeover was called off, the police searched Wirecard's offices and launched a criminal investigation into Braun and three other executives. 
and the Philippines banks, said to be holding the billions, told EY the claims were spurious. Finally, on June 18, 2020, Wirecard announced that 1.9 billion euros was missing, and on June 22, they were forced to admit that the money probably did not exist. Share prices plummeted from 104.5 euros to 1.28 euros. Investors lost 20 billion euros, and Braun, along with a number of others, were arrested on suspicion of false accounting. Braun currently awaits trial with the possibility of 15 years imprisonment. Marzalek, on the other hand, boarded a private jet to Minsk and then disappeared into Russia. Due to the sheer size and complexity of the case, it could be years before we ever discover what really went on with Wirecard. Did someone embezzle the money, or did it never exist? Was Braun a mastermind, a willing participant, or a naive victim of Marzalek? Did EY's auditors miss the red flags due to incompetence or corruption? And what about Boffin? It's already come out that some of its employees were using their inside knowledge to trade on Wirecard stock. But how much deeper is the rot? There's only one man with all the answers, but he's currently hiding in Russia.